So what I'm going to talk to you about is uh, my new world religion, uh, is, is, is ism. Uh, and really, I'm going to talk about shared values uh, for uh, the world, for a global culture. So I have a multimedia and exhibition design company, and this means I don't have to be a specialist in anything. My projects vary from science to religion to culture and everything in between, uh, which is much more fun, particularly because we live in a very compartmentalised world. Now, I feel very strongly that when we're asked to design exhibitions, uh, we tend to be told... Uh, we, we usually, you know, we have clients who are very specialised. The archaeologists want to talk about pot shards. And we say, well, it's not really about pot shards. It's not even about pots. The proper study of man is man. And people are much more interested, what does this pot tell me about the people who used it? Traditionally, the human was thought of as being body, mind, and soul. But I say, if you put the soul and the mind on right brain, that it's your intuitive mind and your creative mind, and you put your rational mind on the left side, we're still sort of made up of those three components. And you'll very quickly, quickly figure that I've colour-coded uh, the whole talk so that you always know science, nature, material world, the more intuitive world, the religious, and then the creative cultural world, a coloured red, green and uh, blue. Occasionally, and just occasionally, we get asked to do projects that encompass all of those things. And Because I was told you can't mention projects, a certain um, observatory near uh, Cork uh, did an exhibition that I may or may not have had something to do with, with my firm on... Life on Earth, Life in Space, and man's, Mankind's Place in the Universe. Now, this was a wonderful project to think about issues of science, religion, and culture holistically, which we tend not to do. And what I certainly came away from it is that science is quite tentative and quite metaphorical. It's kind of like art, and it's, it's not as cut and dried as they think. And it put me in mind of my own late father, so here's this thing, you know, I am the son delivering the religion from the father. He got very intrigued in the early 50s on the possibility of life in outer space. And he wrote the first book, sort of long before Eric von Danikin, called Flying Saucers Have Landed. But when he was, um, he was also interested in all aspects of science and spiritualism. And when he died at 80 years old, I said, Dad, you know, what have you learnt in your 80 years? And he said, I'll tell you what I've learnt. Quite a lot of humility, that whatever is out there, that the universe is far more complex far weirder than anything that science, religion can explain. Everybody's metaphors struggle to incorporate it. But what I tell you is, whatever is, is. I've no idea what's out there, but I'm sure it's out there and I believe in it. And I thought this was a very sane kind of belief, really. Uh, and he also said, anyone who claims that they know the answer is lying. And you can usually tell who they are because anyone, when you get large groups of men in drag with hats, speaking an arcane language, be they the Ku Klux Klan, witch doctors, academics in robes, high court judges, bishops in mitres, they are almost certainly a conspiracy trying to make money off you by pretending that they have the answers to everything. So I bore that in mind, and I think that's a pretty good guide for life. Now, I wanted to see if I could apply his eyes usefully to what I see the big problem in the world. At the moment, we have this globalisation that we're all concerned. Is it a good thing? Is it a bad thing? We have a world economy. Do we have a global civilization? In the past, civilizations were very clearly defined as groups of people who shared values. Their religion, their science and their culture, however developed, had tended to mesh together and combine to give their lives meaning. I don't think we have that. We have a world economy but we don't have a world culture. We actually have all those things, religion, science, in conflict. It's the exact opposite of, a, of, a, of an integrated civilization, a harmonious civilization. And how do we resolve that? We have religions which, in the light of modern scientific discoveries, appear irrational, dogmatic, sectarian. In the case of sort of uh, fundamentalist um, America, they're waiting for the rapture to go into it. Bye, don't let us detain you, lads. Um, we have culture, high culture, which is elitist, completely detached from the popular culture. There's no meshing together. There is no shared cultural artistic values in Western society. Celebrity worship passes for sort of culture and entertainment. And we have a science, wonderful science, the great thing, about it, producing unsustainable materialistic growth, hence this conflict. So all these ideologies are a complete conflict. We have a world with no shared values. Can, is there anything in the culture, the politics, religion and science of the world that could deliver shared values that we could build a sustainable civilization? Because we don't. Having just a world economy with no 
meaning and no shared ideology is going to hit disaster. You know, the, the planet will sink or blow itself up uh, because of the ideological tensions within this unified economy with people who have nothing in common ideologically. So what could deliver? And to give you an idea, 1971, I backpacked around the world. You know, Americans wore American clothes, ate American food, drove American cars. Asians were all running around with their little yellow book. Europeans were stuffy and old-fashioned. There were three very different cultures. There was a world economy. They traded with each other. Interestingly, when I travel around the world more recently, I find there is this apparent consumer market. Information networks, global brands, mass media have connected us all together. But again, without this stability or harmony of uh, shared values. How did this come about? Some of it, the marketing men did quite cleverly. Again, when I was young, studying in America, American material culture was very different to European culture. Very boring for the marketing men to have to differentiate. So what's happened is they've created what I call the Western cultural hamburger. They've ignored the Atlantic Ocean. They've put the two cultures together, flipped them over, and the Americans now drive, wear English suits, drink French wine, drive German cars. And our kind of good old... Paddy in his cloth cap suit now wears a baseball hat and has a quilted jacket and eats hamburgers. So they've vertically differentiated and clodged those two cultures together. When I thought about it, I realised that actually Asia, that we're so frightened of, has actually infiltrated our culture to an extent for much longer. When the West discovered Japan and Zen aesthetics, I didn't realise till I worked in Japan, the Japanese consider modern art. We laugh at, oh, the Japanese are off buying Van Gogh flowers. They think modern Western art, modern architecture is their culture that we've stolen. They were much closer to modern concepts of design. And when the, you know, cumbrous, pompous Victorian Europe met Japan, the result was modern art, modern architecture, which the Japanese think, you know, We've hitched a ride on their Zen aesthetics of, you know, asymmetrical geometry, less is more. Uh, so actually, this whole fear about the age, you know, the next century is Asian, aesthetically, the last century belonged to Asia. Can politics save the world? The West produced the three great concepts, liberté, égalité, fraternité. Um, the three ideologies that came out of that were obviously égalité, Marxism, Fraternity produced nationalism, not what we need to solve the world's global problems. And within nationalism, democracy worked fine. But we now have a global capitalism that is not accountable. Democratic accountability cannot work in a global economy. You know, it's only, there's only accountability within one little leftover nationalist state. So all three of the world's so-called political systems have failed us and are completely discredited. Religion. Now, religions all have shared values. Surely religion can save us. We have Eastern mysticism, Western activism, hierarchical European religions. Funnily enough, the most Western of religions, the most activist, is Islam. Uh, Christianity, which we belong, is a hybrid between Eastern mysticism and Western activism. There's a sort of activist Islamic bit of Christianity called Protestantism, uh, and there's a sort of fatalistic authoritarian bit, you know, the Greek Orthodox Church. But generally, the Catholic Church, which we are familiar with, was hierarchic. It was a leftover of the Roman Empire. It was modelled on Roman imperial models. Activism, well, we all know <laughs> what that's up to. Um, uh, be it the, uh, you know, the activism of American fundamentalism or the militant activism of Islamic, who are then you know, mutually cancelling each other out at the moment. Then we have, well, science. Can that save us? The scientific method, you know, has produced practical technology and it's produced the scientific paradigm. Wonderful. Seeking universal empirical truths. Maybe we can all subscribe to these and this will unite us. Interestingly enough, science has delivered cause and effect. It's given us a cosmology in a way that religion so couldn't. It's told us extraordinary things like relativity, the nature of matter, life's shared origin, which are very liberating and extraordinary thing. Evolution gives one hope that if this planet blows itself up, it's in the nature of things for a better species to evolve on a better planet somewhere else. They don't sell it that way, but you know, there's a lot of hope in science. But on concomitant, it's given us industrial production and global media works, and all the things that have forced us into this global village when we're not culturally ready for it. Now, interestingly, we find that Eastern mysticism, surprisingly enough, had come up with nearly all of the same ideas that Western science is grindingly still failing to sell to 40% of you know, the American voters that 
evolution actually exists. Years ago, it said cause and effect, laws of karma. People in the East knew that there was billions of worlds. They knew that, that you know, the world wasn't invented 4,000 years ago, like Bishop Usher says. They knew that matter was an illusion. They knew that all life was interconnected. And they understood that everything changes, that humans are just a temporary phase in a great evolution into the ultimate kind of voidness. So I find quite fascinating that we're worried about the East. Well, the East had intuitively discovered or intuited what the Western rational mind has ploddingly and analytically sort of discovered. So universal empirical truths, there is a convergence there. This is hopeful. Uh, the Western scientific paradigm is creaking, uh, which I think very exciting, because what I actually love I learned about science, it's not definitive. It's tentative and metaphorical. It comes up with metaphors. And unlike religion, it's quite happy to ditch the metaphor as soon as it doesn't work and come up with a better one. They couldn't explain the motion of the planets. They had crystal spheres. So Copernicus suddenly, oh, key move, put the sun in the middle, put the earth in the edge. Oh, it all works. You know, new paradigm. We Actually, I think we're right on a threshold. We're uh, another Copernicus. We've reached another crystal sphere stage. The cosmo model isn't working, so we've had to get dark matter and dark energy and multiverses and parallel dimensions to make string theory. Bullshit. There's always some key move they've missed. A new Einstein is going to win the Nobel medal. So like, you've missed something. Oh, Jesus. And it'll all fall back into place. You know. uh, but scientists are very reluctant to admit that actually the whole model is, is in a mess. You know. um, another one is, um, where's E.T.? Modern science says... There's four places just in our solar system where life ought to exist. Why haven't we found it? Why isn't it there? If that statistically is the case, that one solar system has four planets where there ought to be the right conditions for life, the, the, the universe should be teeming with life. Why, why haven't we been rung up by ET? You know, something strange. Actually, it's because of very uh, ethnocentric thinking. Why should alien intelligences have developed a technology? The little man swimming with the whale there isn't very well adapted. He's got the, all this breathing gear. The whale is probably more intelligent, probably a superior species, so well adapted. He doesn't need radios and telephones. He can communicate by whale song for hundreds of miles. Hopefully, when we blow ourselves up, the whales will you know, inherit the ocean and the aliens will arrive and say, God, thank God you got rid of those guys. Um, <laughs> the differences of scale just on our Earth between an ant and a uh, uh, a whale means that clearly there must be vast differences of scale. There could be life forms so big and so slow, you know, vast clouds of interstellar uh, you know, biochemicals could be thinking, could be conscious. You know, it's just an arrangement of matter. Empirical observation, it can produce completely the wrong results. Empirically, they worked out that, you know, the Irish had come from the east. They were farmers. They replaced the hunter-gatherers just done the DNA and found that the Milesian legend of a king of Spain with an Egyptian princess came and found, it's true, the Irish came from Spain with a bit of North African blood and settled on the west coast. The farming came when they sent off for seed catalogues and a book of instructions to people from the east. You know, the scholars said Awan Macha, Tain by Achilles, all a legend, that's a Bronze Age tomb and these are medieval fairy tales. I haven't been reading the archaeologists who dug in and found a huge wooden building with 34 compartments, exactly carbon dated to the time that the Cahullan was supposed to have lived. Lots of dead bodies and weapons in the moat and clearly there was a cattle raid that took place in Andhra BC. You know, uh, and you can see how these mistakes can arise. If you archaeologists had no written records of modern Ireland, they could infer that people from the Balearic Islands landed in West Cork in the 70s with their hacienda bungalows and their Benetton clothes, and they pushed the native Irish into the top northeastern six counties where there's a line of defensive forts, and north of that line everyone's eating a wee fray and wearing cloth caps, and the Irish put up a heroic last stand, but then they were overrun by the bungalow folk and were taken as captives back to the Mediterranean, and all their pubs were demolished, and the Irish pubs were put as trophies all around the coast of the Mediterranean and replaced with cappuccino bars in Ireland, you see. So, and people knock religion for being intolerant and persecuting heretics. Every school kid with this code used to cut out Africa and South America, shove them together, and say, oh, look, continental drift. When Pearl Alfred Regener suggested, he was hounded to his death by the rest of the scientific community. And it was only when I did a project for the Natural History Museum on plate tectonics, I said, I want to tell the story of Alfred Regener. And the Natural History Museum in London said, Mr. Leslie, science is about objective facts not subjective personalities. We want no mention of this man in our exhibition. And I said, you bastards, you spent the first half of your scientific career believing the wrong theory. You still haven't forgiven him. Uh, so, uh, you know, religion gets not. So scientific describes but doesn't explain. Fundamentally, and this is a really important point, 
we take cause and effect for granted. We take the Big Bang happens, and then matter all behaves the same, and every effect has an equal. There's no philosophical reason why there should be cause and effect. It's a complete mystery. Never mind the mystery of what happened before the Big Bang. Even if you say, well, there was another universe, and it's a black hole. Well, what caused that universe, and what was before that one? So it's fundamentally mysterious. The metaphor is not nearly as complex as the reality. So all of these things, like intelligence, what is the nature of creative intelligence, Scientific metaphors require intuition to imagine, and science doesn't tell us how to live. So my conclusion is, can we apply my father's ism to this? So what is ism? I think is-ism is being open to ideas, whether they're rational ideas, whether they're intuitive, spiritual ideas, or whether they're creative ideas, because the human require all three of those elements to be in balance. We need a philosophy that realises that reality transcends any scientific metaphor we can come up, any cultural metaphor, any spiritual metaphor. All of these are needed to give meaning to our life. Just being consumers isn't enough. We need values and meaning from an understanding of how spiritual ideas, practical, analytical, scientific ideas, and how creative metaphors can all help each other out. So that means that shared values for a global culture... I feel that culture teaches the other things um, that imagination counts. Today, scientists come up with imaginative theorems and then look for evidence to prove it. In the past, they looked at phenomena and said, Jesus, how does this work? You know, string theory and quantum physics, none of it's proven. It's all come out of imaginative ideas. Einstein used to imagine ideas and then try and sort of mathematically test them. But culture needs Zen design. We need to learn from the East. Less is more. Recyclability is sustainable. We need a much more less consumerist world. Uh, politics needs practicalism. None of the ideologies work. It has to deal with each problem. And because we can't have a global political system, we have to make sure that all political societies have respect for the human individual and respect for the environment that comes out of from both science and from mysticism. Religion teaches us awe about all of this, and that needs to be applied across everything. But it needs to learn the perspective from science rather than poo-pooing science. Science gives more awe to life. You know, evolution is such an amazing, liberating concept. It's, it's religious in its scope. Science gives us hope because it gives us the tools to perhaps approach solving some of these problems. Uh, but it needs to learn a lot more humility and to realise that imagination and intuition often gets there ahead of it. So I... I present you Isism. <laughs> <laughs> Shared values for a global culture. <laughs>